Taylor and Brown on their way to the mound and this could be all for Harris. He has pitched a beauty. Give me Christopher. You want Christopher? I know he hadn't done very well against this guy, but I got a hunch he's due. <laughs> presents let's get to it's baseball from sea to shining sea by the team that brings you home and now your host james christopher and welcome to let's get to i am your host james christopher and welcome to the show that covers baseball from sea to shining sea brought to you by the team that brings you home home Baseball is full of iconography, and there were many directions that we could have taken this show when we decided to refresh the brand. We could have based a look on balls or on bats, diamonds, but we chose home for a reason. The vibe of this show has always been about a positive view on baseball and on sports. You can just call us the anti-barstool, but we always wanted it to be a community where all you needed to do to get in the door was love baseball. Not love a particular team or hated team, but simply love the game that many of us agree might be in need of more people who love it. We'd always hoped that we would build a community of people who love this amazing game. And it happened in a way that we never could have expected. And a big part of that community has been Don Gillingham. Now, Don is so important that we, in fact, named our Fan of the Year the Don Gillingham Award. Named it after him because he's been one of the best. Don loves the show. He's been a big cheerleader for it since day one. He's the one who coined the phrase, first lady of minor league baseball, that he then bestowed upon Jessica, which she low-key loves. Now, Don is dealing with some health issues. I'm not going to get into what, but let's just say he's up against it. And even through all of that... He's still ready for the season to start, ready for our show to start. So keep Don in your thoughts and prayers. Don, we're praying for you, and we're cheering you on. And because he wouldn't want us to spend too much time on that, but instead would want us to jump right into the episode, we've got a great one for you, so stay with us. On the St. Louis team, we have uh, who's on first, what's on second. I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to find out. I want you to tell me the names of the fellas on the St. Louis team. I'm telling you, who's on first, what's on second. I don't know who's on third. Do you know the fellas' names? Yes. Well, then who's playing first? Yes. I mean, the fellas' Who's on first? The Let's Get To Team of the Week. And we're excited to welcome to what I just informed him before the camera rolled that this will be at least an annual appearance by John Kosis from your... Columbia Fireflies, John. Uh, yeah, you're you're part of the team now, man. Whether you like it or not, I love it. This is a great team to be a part. Of. You guys do incredible work. Thanks so much for having me on this year, and I guess as an annual guest. That's right. Yeah, there you go. You might you know pop in on one of our live shows when we do it. It would be a great time. You know, it's funny because we definitely visited. Uh, we visited the Fireflies last season. It was one of our favorite trips. Um, if you recall, John, it was also one of the first trips where you and I recognized. Wow, the pitch clock is making a difference. Um, in our cases for ill, what are your thoughts about that? Before we get into Firefly season, just the sort of Major League Baseball adapting that this year. I love it. I can't tell you how many random people have called me. Like my grandparents uh, called me right after we had finished like our normal call time. And they're like, oh my God, we forgot to ask you about how you feel about this, but we're going out with a bunch of friends and we know they want to know how to feel about it. So tell us how. Um, And I love it because what I noticed last year in seeing us do it a little bit more extreme, right? We had 14 and 18 seconds. It'll be 15 and 20 seconds um, in major league baseball. But Uh, What I noticed is all it cut down on was guys adjusting their batting gloves every single pitch or guys walking three times around the mound before they step on the rubber. It was all the nonsense. And if you think about basketball, football, any other professional sport that's major in America has some form of clock, right? And this isn't a clock limiting action or game time, right? It's just, it's the shot clock 
we're not going to let you dribble outside the three point line for five minutes because you're trying to protect a two point lead. You have to force action. Right. Or um, we're not going to let you sit in the huddle for a minute and a half. Right. Because there is a play clock. And if you don't do it, it's a delay of game. Right. So that's the auto ball or the auto strike, depending on who's at fault. But, you know, I like that a lot. And then the, the bases thing, I didn't even notice last year any market difference. But if someone tells me it's safer, if someone tells me it's going to increase stolen bases because yeah. we get the extra two inches to grab to, I'm all for that. Because as a kid, I grew up watching Kenny Lofton play for Cleveland oh. and Ricky Henderson. Yeah. And those guys are electric. And, you know, I got to witness before the bases increased in size, Tyler Tolbert steal 49 bases and. 90 games for the fireflies or whatever it was and that was super exciting because anytime he got on base you know he could walk and you're like that's almost as good as a triple so um yeah. to, well to i grew that. up at the same age where it's like action on the base path is as exciting as a home run in my opinion mm-hmm. and you can create more more opportunities for that with a slightly bigger base especially when you get a guy like Kyle Tucker, who he might be a 40, 40 guy this year with the, the shift going away and the base is getting a little bigger. Yeah. And I guess with the shift going away too, you know, any more people on the base path, it's, it's getting rid of the three true outcomes because data has made it. So it's like, I know this guy's going to hit the ball between this spot and this spot 70% of the time. Right. You know, we'll, we'll give him the 5% of the time he hits up the third baseline. If by some freak accident, he does yeah. it, but, for the most part, I can corral it in lower batting averages. I can't remember the exact statistic I saw, but it was something to the effect of the average batting average in like the 80s was like 250 or 260. And now it's 230 or 240, right? Yeah. So there is a significant amount of people who, yep, I can't beat the shift. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to try and hit a home run. And if I get five extra home runs, I might be able to play an extra two years, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's like it was watching uh, watching the Strohs put four men in the outfield against Joey Gallo. Like, yeah, I mean, it, it was like little league. All right, everybody, move up. Except we're just gonna <laughs> move up, move back. Now let's talk a little Fireflies baseball because you guys do have your promotional schedule up. Your promotional schedule is such a big deal. Now, before we get into this um, hardcore, anyway, do you ever get disappointed when May the Fourth isn't on a Saturday and you can just have the ultimate Star Wars night? So what's interesting about it is last year, it was on a Wednesday, if I remember correctly. And we had a day game, noon. And oh, wow. This this last year, South Carolina still had COVID restrictions in for field trips. So we, we banked on that being a day where we were going to have a lot of field trip kids out. And we had zero field trip kids out. So we played in front of not a ton of people. And uh, it was noon. We had the Star Wars jerseys for the first time, but we decided not to auction them off and, and to do it on Saturday night because the benefits for that went to St. Jude's. And we want to make sure that that was like a really big check right. we could get St. Jude's. And Saturday night ended up being really cool. I had my doubts about like impromptu doing a second Star Wars night kind of, but um, Saturday night ended up being really, really cool. And uh, this year, I'm, I'm not sure how much I can give away about the jersey because we haven't unleashed it yet. But what I'll tell you is uh, it is a a jersey that is very cool. I I like it a lot more than last year's. But last year's was great. It was just original trilogy. um, You know, it had the crossing lightsabers on the front, the Death Star on the back. And I thought I'd seen a lot of designs similar to it before. This year it is. I've never seen anyone quite like this. I've seen a couple that feature this character. But um, with what's coming out in a couple of months, I think it's going to tie in very nicely with what Disney's trying to do. It might be a very high, um, high demand Jersey this year. My wife is so upset with you right now. (laughs) Just teasing another star Wars fan, right? Yeah. Just, it's like, yeah, it's actually funny. Um, I'm going to see the eerie sea wolves finally, and Mm -hmm. I moved my date and I've already started separating jerseys that I'm wearing, and I, they have an awesome Star Wars night that I won. It's like the Astros thing, but instead of the star, it's a tie, it's an X wing. Oh, that's it turns awesome! Out I'm, I'm now accidentally going on Star Wars night too. The Force is strong with me. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the other theme nights you guys have going because, you know, I, I know that there's a lot of old people who are like, "This is dumb. Why do we do this stuff in baseball?" I love it. What are some of the other kind of fun stuff we can look forward to? Uh, so this year we're we're replaying a couple of the theme nights from last year, but we're moving around. So last year we did Human Cannonball Night late in the year, 
And there were a lot of people who were like, man, I wish you did this while school was still in session because I would have liked to go to it. So we're doing it on like a Thursday. Actually, we're doing that on May 4th, um, presented by Columbia College. Uh, but we'll have the human cannonball shooting uh, across the infield yet again this year. And that was a super cool promotion last year. I feel like any type of act is always fun because there's not the, oh, something could go wrong, but it's just, hey, someone's performing this, you know, like, you know, evil can evil. I think a lot of times you go, oh man, something could legitimately go wrong, but fortunately everything's very safe today. <laughs> um, we're doing Paw Patrol night again this year, but we're adapting it. Last year we had the Dalmatian firefighter and the police officer. So Chase, and I can't remember the other one's name, but this year it's going to be Sky and Rubble, um, who are, you know, two different mascots that kids can take pictures with and stuff like that. So that'll be really cool. And then my personal favorite weekend I'm looking forward to is we're having Dinosaur Weekend. I've been an advocate of Dinosaur Weekend my entire minor league career. Um, we're bringing Ed's dinosaurs out, which means we're going to have animatronic dinosaurs at the ballpark. Whoa which I'm super excited for because that's going to feel a lot like Jurassic Park. Like, did they find something in Amber or what's going on, right? Yeah. I'm super excited for Dinosaur Week. How many times are you going to say, clever girl? Um, <laughs> so, uh, two I want to talk to you about. First of all, almost keeping in the same theme, but not. Uh, Riverbanks Zoo and Garden Night. I'm a big animal guy, big zoo guy. Tell me a little bit about what's going to happen that night and what the why the purpose of doing this this uh, this celebration. Yeah, so we're going to have a uh, jersey auction, again, still finalizing the details for the jersey, but it's actually going to be, um, there's something called the ARC, which Colombians understand it's uh, the wildlife, um, like the the water wildlife. So we're talking coral, we're talking jellyfish, uh, clownfish, like all those different types of animals um, in different tanks. It hadn't been renovated since the 80s, so they put out a huge like capital fund this last year, and they're going to open it in March or April. Okay. Uh, so we're kind of doing a jersey to commemorate the ARC opening up, uh, and then the proceeds are going to go to their nonprofit that helps feed and take care of the animals and stuff, which will be fantastic. Um, we also had a player last year, Carter Jensen. Um, he was the MVP of our team for the Royals. And he was also the only uh, Fireflies All-Star last year, but he had a tattoo of a lion. So we got um, it's Safe Federal Bank, who is sponsoring the bobblehead. Um, but we have him, and he's petting a lion next to him. Uh, so it's a oh, Carter Jensen lion bobblehead. That's awesome. I love that. That is about about adorable. Um, the other big big weekend that you guys will have is uh, you know we've we, we've talked Copa a lot how important that is. But now you're you, minor league baseball for the second year is really going to be acknowledging Jackie Robinson and mm -hmm. the Negro leagues with the nine initiative. So tell me a little bit about what that looks like for you guys in Columbia. Yeah. So we're going to have Negro league weekend again. Uh, this year it's going to be called Negro league celebration weekend. Last year we had Josh Gibson's great grandson come out and speak mm -hmm. uh, the year prior. It was a Larry Doby um, angle. It was, I, it wasn't a direct family member, but it was like a Larry Doby historian who spoke after the game this year we haven't finalized who it's going to be specifically but we're working with larry doby's family to get another person because larry doby grew up uh 45 minutes away until he was like five or six and he moved to new jersey um so he's he's actually from around south carolina around the midlands area uh, so we we like being able to give him a shout out um if that doesn't work out we're going to work with frank robinson probably so yes. we're, we're trying to keep local ties because frank robinson played for the columbia reds um while they were here in the that would have had to be the 50s i believe but um so we're, we're trying to stick with the local ties and to again just talk about the history because I think a lot of people definitely are starting to understand how important Negro League baseball was historically, but I don't think a lot of people realize, like, there are teams that weren't the Kansas City Monarchs. There are teams that weren't the Indianapolis yeah. Clowns or uh, or the Grays over by Pittsburgh. So uh, there's a ton of fantastic Negro League history here in South Carolina, and, and we try and shed a little bit more light on that each and every year. Uh, and I've, I, I've been very excited to see minor league baseball steer into that. With Round Rock, it's been the Austin Black Senators, so it's been really cool to see them. Again, like you said, we're finally acknowledging that those were some really good ball players who we don't know about because they were not allowed to play. Um, now, you also wrote a book. 
Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the book. To ever give everybody the title again, and and how has the response been since we checked in with you about four or five months ago? Yeah, so the response has been fantastic. I've kind of been uh, blown away by it a little bit because uh, I I have obviously been on your podcast. Um, I, I talked with the Dad Hack Chronicles, and I've had a lot of other people reach out who are scheduling. Um, like speaking uh, arrangements and stuff like that for when it comes out in June. Uh, so it's it's for uh, pre-sale. It's available right now on Amazon, on McFarlandBooks.com. But in June, uh, those those books will finally be delivered to people um, that have been uh, on pre-sale so far. And uh, Sabre wants me to do uh, a talking series with them. And my uh, college has a, a podcast associated with Ohio University, and they want me to to do that. Um, I've been asked to speak with a couple local colleges as well uh, about the book. So it's it's kind of cool just like having all these people reach out after you do uh, a lot of the hard work and stuff. And they say, hey, like if people wanted to do this, particularly students, how would they do something like this? And I yeah. think that's something that as uh, an adult who works in in public sector, so to speak, it's really awesome to be able to understand that some kids might also want to do this and I could help them out in that dream. This is why you're like the nicest guy in baseball. Um, and the book is play by play from the minors profiles of baseball broadcasters from Scranton to Yakima. I don't know why I did the accent there. All right. Now I do have a surprise for you. Sort of not really a surprise. I shouldn't, I should not, should not oversell it. I have fresh rapid fire questions. Ooh, I am excited for that. When we, when we had a production meeting, uh, Eric Mertens, Eric, the peanut guy was like, Hey man, uh, you asked the same 10 questions. Okay, fine, fine. So we've got five new ones. Okay. And we're going to play a little rapid fire. Um, what is your favorite part of the off season? My favorite part of the off season is every year I do some form of a camping trip. And I just unplug for four or five days, visit a park I've never been to before, and just experience the wild. Normally I'll make like a homemade chili one night over the fire and then do – um, apples wrapped up in, in tin foil and cinnamon and all the unhealthy things, sugar and butter and stuff like that to make kind of like apple pie filling, but roasted by a fire. Uh, just all the things you can imagine over the fire cooked. And then of course, typically 10 to 15 miles a day in hiking. And, and that just gets me completely reset and ready for next baseball season. But I've always been an outdoor person. Is this a solo camping trip? Uh, I go with my brother sometimes. Okay. Sometimes I go solo. It, it all depends on how schedules match up. Like my cousin and I went one year, so it's every year it's something different. But uh, you can't always go by always yourself because this is how me. horror movies start. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're not wrong. Just saying that. All right, when you're visiting a city, what is your go-to food that helps you define the town? I think it depends, right? So if I'm somewhere on the seaboard, so like say I go to salisbury maryland to visit the marva shorebirds something involving crab right like a crab right. cake or something in maryland but if i go to greenville south carolina i gotta try their barbecue right or if i go to memphis i gotta try something slow roasted right so i think it's whatever regionally that area is known for um like i don't think i would get a burger in california i would try something that's more like Maybe like, a, again, like a seafood type thing, like a sushi or something light, right? Like just whatever that area is known for. Isn't it interesting? You can't really think about California. Like it's such a weird place of people from all over the place that I can't think of. Oh, what defines that state? Interesting. Well, and I, I shot myself in the foot there because it's so big. Um, like if you go to Napa, you're probably going to go to a winery at some point, right? Like Northern, Northern California, you go to a winery. Southern California, you're, you're thinking more seafood. You're thinking... Uh, like their trout is very good around there and stuff like that. So yeah, I guess it just depends on where, where you're going. Okay. Godfather one or two. Ooh, man. Uh, I, I will say my grandfather Delicio would have us watch Godfather one every Christmas. Uh, so, okay. so I'll stick with Godfather one just because it's a Christmas tradition in, uh, my mother's family. Okay. I love that. All right. Dad hat, flex fit or fitted. Uh, I am very, very much a dad hat. Like you got to have the adjustable thing in the back. I, I don't love the fitted hats and I like being able to bend the brim. Uh, I used to wear my hat when I played like Johnny Damon, where it's almost like a complete end right. on your head. So I, I certainly am a big dad hat guy. 
All right. Which of the new rules needs to go? Now we already talked about like we already talked about we like the bases, we like the uh the 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 clock. Any rule in the last five years that's been introduced, which one do we need to get rid of? In the last five years, I even I like the ghost runner too during regular season, as long as it doesn't touch the playoffs. Um well, it's not even ghost runner, the place runner, I should say. <laughs> but uh, I, I like that rule too. I, I don't know. I like a lot of the rules that have been implemented. Maybe replay. Um, and this will be controversial, but like during the playoffs, there were a couple replays where guys were sitting around for three, four, five minutes and it was like, hey, the ball's either fair or foul. But right now, that pitcher is not going to be able to throw yeah. accurately. Uh, because he's been waiting too long or that batter is not going to be in the game or you cut the momentum. I really don't like that. Um, That's something even in football I don't love. I understand the joy of getting something right, being able to review it, but it's 2023. There's got to be a quicker way. It always seems like the broadcasters are ahead of the officials too. Yeah, and like tennis is so good. Tennis, they literally make it like immediately. How do we get mainstream sports to do what tennis has been doing for 15 years? Right. Um, I think the other one that the other rule that bothered, I don't like the limits to the throwing over and, you know, I, I'm going to be interested to see if that one sticks. Cause you are taking away a cat and mouse part of the game that I don't, I don't necessarily love that. Now, um, John, before we go, we were going to do a shout out to somebody who are we doing a shout out to? Uh, we're going to do it to my brother. Who's about to head over on uh, the boat, so to speak, and be off land for a little bit. So Mike, Super proud of you. Thanks so much for your service in the Navy. Uh, hope you have some fun catching the hook and and flying off the carrier for a little bit. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fun. I remember when basic training, when they asked me if I wanted to go airborne, and I was like, the plane will land, right? I can be on it. No big deal. He is John Kostas of your Columbia Fireflies. John, thanks so much for jumping on. Thanks for having me, James. Always a pleasure. Raiders of the Lost Diamond, digging into baseball's past. Now, normally I do it myself, but this time I'm bringing a guest with me. We've got Donnie Wise on the line. Donnie, first of all, it's been about nine months. Uh, baseball's back. How you doing? Doing great. I'm just ready for games to get started here in about uh, four weeks. And well, you get maybe about... less with the, the uh, World Baseball Classic and spring training. How, but... how, in, how into the World Baseball Classic do you think you're going to get? Do you, do you, um... you think you'll dive in? I'll, I'll probably dive in probably more this year than I have in the past. I mean, I've I've followed it some, but this year I think I'll probably jump in a little bit more. Okay, and then I, you and of course you're coming to the fifth birthday party, which is going to be a blast. Yeah. So can't wait. I'm but we're talking, super excited. Uh, yeah, no, I am too. Uh, but we're talking uh, baseball in Columbia, and one of the things that I love about this is is not just learning about the teams that exist now and the communities that they exist in but the past and you're a bit of a of a historian when it comes to this so take me through the history of baseball in Columbia well uh from what i've been able to to piece together here the first game or first season ever played was the Columbia Senators in 1892 wow okay uh, first known baseball game i should say is 1867 but it wasn't an organized league or anything so they had one season of the senators and then it really wasn't much of anything till like 1903 when the uh the South Atlantic League started forming the original South Atlantic League. They were a charter member, uh, came in actually as the skyscrapers. Okay. Which, back then, sky, skyscrapers was probably 10 story buildings. <laughs> right. But you know, it's funny though. Like you, so you mentioned, you mentioned the Sally League is now, you know, the Sally League is well over a hundred, a hundred years old. Yeah. And I, I'm going back to when Manford got rid of the league names for a while. Like, like you can't just throw out a hundred years of history. I'm sorry. That's yeah. Fine. That, and and it's really skewed all of the like all of the record books, everything for that one year. Cause it's like you had South Atlantic League and then you have like, you know, low A East or whatever for one <laughs> right. season. And then it went back to something else. It just really yeah. messed things up. It shocker. They should have just left it alone and then just changed transitioned at some point and left it like it was. Shocker. All right. So but, but yeah, um, you said the, yeah, so so the they, skyscrapers, uh, yeah. Yeah, so they started out as the skyscrapers, bounced around a few other names throughout the years, early uh, 
early part of the century. You had the Gamecocks, which was the local university name, and they did that for a couple of seasons. And, uh, yeah, the Chicks, you had the Palmettos. Uh, eventually, their longest standing in that time period was the, the, the Comers or the Commissioners or the Commies, whichever way you wanted to go with it, which is, you know, the hat I'm wearing here is a throwback to the 1911 team that okay, uh, first of all how hilarious that there's a red star back there because obviously commie didn't mean like you don't like in the 50s you're not running around saying i'm playing for the commies right it, it took on a new new meaning in the 50s than than what it took on in the early 1900s <laughs> right so uh yeah they, but they had a lot of success uh through those years they won league championship in uh four really four consecutive years out of five years because they didn't operate in 1918 due to World War One, but 17, 19, 20, and 21, they won the league championship. So it's yeah. pretty successful baseball then. Yeah, absolutely. And you, th- you, you wonder what they would have done in 18. Yeah. They're, um, the first South Atlantic League game they actually played too as the skyscrapers in 1904 was against the team from Augusta. Uh, they won that game eight seven, and it featured a player on the Augusta team by the name of Ty Cobb. Ooh. So that's pretty interesting that their first uh, game uh, he played in here, and he went on to success. You know, the year yeah. after that, he became a, a household name. A household name <laughs> for lots of reasons. Not all of them. Good. Um, another famous, no, and another <laughs> famous competitor uh, probably played multiple games here against them. I don't really have any specifics, but I did find this in some of my notes. Is that uh, you know, Shoeless Joe played here. He was from the upstate of South Carolina. Yeah. So it, it made sense that in his uh, early professional days, he would have played some against uh, the Columbia team. Well, yeah, because he's from like Greenville area, right? Or I know that right. they have a whole thing for him out there, the drive. Dude. Yeah, and in fact, after the 1919 scandal, he came back to Greenville and uh, bounced around a lot of the the mill teams and the, you know, the factory leagues and things like that. He just loved playing baseball and stuff. So, yeah, it uh Anyway, so it was a good history, you know, up until like uh, around around the, uh, the the 20s there. And then um, they uh, – well, actually till the 30s as the comic, uh, commerce. But uh, in 1927, um, uh, Barney Dreyfus, who owned the Pittsburgh Pirates at the time, he actually put up the capital to build a new stadium here in Columbia for his minor league team. Uh-huh. Uh, they were a Pirates affiliate in 27, and uh, it was named uh, – Dreyfus Field opened up in 1927 uh, on what is the site still of Capital City Stadium, Capital City Park. I mean, that field began in that way. And uh, to, in, in mentioning uh, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, he actually attended that game, that very first game in 1927. I love that that's – that's what I think I, what I love about this game so much is that you can date it back. Like you can go to that field and know that again, a hundred years ago, people were playing baseball or almost a yeah. hundred. Like, I, I think that's the one thing I love about the sport more than anything else is that it's rooted in its history. Exactly. And um, you know, so it's, it, it, it has that longstanding history. I mean, basically home plate there is where it was in 27, all these famous players, all these famous people that came through and played, Throughout the years, through all the different ones we're going to talk about coming up here in a few more minutes, um, they all played on that same field. And um, it's just neat to know that it's still there. It's it's unfortunate to know that uh, there's still a possibility it may go away. I mean, there's been a lot of talk in the last few years, a lot of ownership changes. Somebody yeah. wants to develop that property. But right now, the, st- the field is still standing. And um, all I know is if I win the lottery, I'm buying it and I'm going to clean it up. <laughs> well, you know, I, I hope at a minimum, it's interesting because we were in Little Rock with Scott McIntyre, um, who produces the show and they basically kept the scoreboard up of their old park. So everything is developed, but at least you can see where, where, where it was played. So hopefully if they do develop the area, they at least do something to kind of commemorate what was there. Yeah, I, I hope so too. There, the one thing is, there's a a, a very uh, a long uh, cinder block wall along the uh, road there, and uh, it's had different murals over the years and stuff. And uh, last time I was out there, it still had some of the old uh, Capital City Bombers artwork and stuff on it. 
uh, or blowfish. They had the blowfish because they came in after the bombers. Yeah. And, um, you know, that wall is, I think, probably been there since it was originally built as a field. I mean, the, the stands have all been remodeled and changed, but but that wall, I think, is the one constant of that that location that is still there. Um, the street that it's actually on is called Dreyfus Road, so it will maintain that sort of tie forever as the name right. of the road right there that runs right behind home plate. So, um, interesting little, um, you know, tidbit there. Yeah. They, uh, so they played, like I said, through the, through the 1930s as, uh, the Comers. And then there was a little lag in, uh, in the time frame there for, uh, for baseball in Columbia. Um, they came back in, uh, 36 and 37 as the Columbia Senators, which was actually also another, uh, well, that was that first name from 1892. They resurrected that very first <laughs> yeah. name for a couple of seasons. So bringing back an old name is not new. No, not not at all. <laughs> and um, so that, that was, you know, a couple of years is that. And then the Cincinnati Reds basically came in and created a farm team here, and they became the Columbia Reds in 1938. And they stayed as the Reds uh, through the 55 season, um frank robinson's probably the most famous player during that entire time frame that played here in columbia for the reds um they spent two seasons uh as the gems because the reds actually moved to savannah for two se- seasons and <laughs> a new team popped up for two seasons and then <laughs> they came back from savannah because the uh uh you know the the, the success wasn't or the, the funding, the crowd didn't really support them there. So from 58 to 61, they came back to Columbia and then finally went away. Yeah. Okay. There was a long gap then from 61 to 83. There was no baseball in Columbia. Wow. That is a lot. No, that's a long time. Yeah. It, uh, 22 years there, no, no baseball. In fact, uh, what was funny is that field just kind of sat idle for all those years and was used periodically um, I had an uncle that played high school baseball and he played a lot of games on that field during the seventies, late early seventies when he was in high school. Okay. And that's uh, kind of interesting. They at least tried to use it for, for stuff like that. But uh, it was 1983 when the, uh, the Shelby Mets relocated to Columbia became the Columbia Mets. Um, and an interesting fact about uh, that, that I found didn't really know. So Colum- there's a Columbia native name of, uh, Kirby Higby, he played for the Brooklyn Dodgers back in the uh, the forties. Um, he actually played for the Comers uh, as well in um, nineteen thirty six, and or excuse me, the the Senators at that time. That's when they came back as the Senators. Um, then went on to play twelve years in the majors. Uh, played in the World Series in nineteen forty one. That was his best year. He was actually at the press conference in 1983 when they announced the uh, arrival of the Columbia Mets and threw out the first pitch in the first oh. home game of the Columbia Mets. I love so, that. So at what point I, – I keep cutting you off. I'm sorry. but That's okay. At, at what point do you start to have a connection to the history? Like, um, My connection probably started in that early 80s. That's when I was okay. in high school. I was playing high school baseball. Um, I had a, a, a friend in high school, her brother tried out for the Columbia Mets and didn't quite make it, but he played baseball in high school and they had an open tryout in the area. Um, I thought he was good enough to play, but he just, he didn't make the team, but really that's where I started following them was, was in, in the eighties uh, as the Mets. And then we would go out to games, you know, I was off to college a lot of those years. So I wasn't around Columbia, but, um, yeah. I settled down in 1990, got married and stayed here since then. So Okay. I really got back into the Mets and then the Bombers. Okay. Um, but I know the Bombers are going to be the crux of our discussion. Um, sure. Bombs away. Let's talk a little bit about the Bombers. Um, I wonder if it's a name you could get away with today. You know, I don't I don't know. I, sorry, I'm not going to get on my soapbox about people needing to lighten up. Um, anyway, <laughs> continue. <laughs> well, I mean, given the given the context of it, if, if you stay within the context and the logo, I mean, it was a bomber plane. Um Okay. Yeah, I mean, I still there might be some issues, but um, really the bomber's name came from the history of the area. Lake Murray, which is a huge lake here outside of Columbia. I, I, in fact, I live literally a mile down the road is the lake. Um, so the bomber's name came because the Doolittle Raiders um, did all their practice bombing runs on Lake Murray uh, <laughs> before the world, you know, to, to go drop the bombs in, in Japan 
the, you know, all of their, their, they were based here in Columbia at the Columbia okay. airport. It, was, it used to be the Columbia army airfield, uh, before it was the Columbia airport. And, um, so that whole history with the Doolittle's Raiders and all that, the bombing runs, they pulled during uh, the 90s when the bombers were actually the team name, uh, they fished an old bomber plane, B-25 bomber, out of the lake that had crash landed during one of those training runs at back Whoa. in the day. Um, and they they tried to restore it. They, they It's actually on display uh, here in Columbia at the old Owens Field. Um, it, and so that whole history with that, with the military and the bomber planes, that just, it just really fit. Um, they, they had just updated the stadium too. They renovated it in 91 when they were still the Mets, but by 93, when they changed to the bombers, um, th they actually were pushing hard in 91, 92. I re even remember the stories. They were so much trying to get a double A team to come here. They built that, renovated that stadium to the current at that time, current, double a standards to try and lure a double a team here and it didn't work so their next best thing is let's create a whole new identity and get away from you know the parent club name which was fantastic i mean it went over so well here and i mean it just was the perfect fit with the history of the area and everything it seems like the i mean it, it, like you and i follow the sport um a lot and every time i see a, a team with the parent club. I just think to myself, you're missing. It's just, not, it's just from a business perspective, you're missing. Out. Right. Exactly. And, um, you know, so it, it, but it's funny too, when you look at the history of Columbia, you know, again, the, the most recent history since 83, when they were the Mets, they were as the bombers, they were a Mets affiliate. When the, they returned in 2016 with the fireflies from 2016 to 2020, they were a Mets affiliate. So they've been a Mets affiliate off and on for 38 years until Manford changed everything. And now they're a Royals affiliate, <laughs> but there's a, a huge ingrained fandom here of Mets fans. And of course I'm not one. I was a Yankees fan. Right. That's a whole other story from my past. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the funny part of that too, is that when the bombers left Columbia, and moved to Greenville, they changed affiliations and they became a Boston Red Sox affiliate, yeah. which as a Yankees fan, I couldn't get behind that. Oh so yeah. Continue being a fan of the team when they moved. I mean, nowadays I would have a whole different outlook on it just because sure. it doesn't matter about affiliation to me as much as I love all the teams in minor league baseball. But back then I was like, okay, I'm done with you. And I had yeah. no team personally for 12 years to support so <laughs> brother the round rock express are now the uh triple a team for the texas rangers and i'm telling you even my wife and i are like it's just less fun now i don't know why <laughs> it's just less fun exactly so you know i I've, I've passed that now but that was really a big thing back then but you know as the bombers i mean we had a lot of different uh i mean we had ron washington as a manager the first couple of years as the bombers 94 95 he came in um we've had you know they they did win talking about championships you, you know we talked about the other ones you know the, the mets columbia mets won two championships uh 86 91 uh the bombers won in, in 98 fireflies have yet to win a championship so they columbia's itching for that championship yeah. uh run again of something well speaking of the fireflies like we had john on the show we met out there and and it's sort of like that's the natural progression to where we'll get close to wrapping up but what was your reaction when that was the new moniker? Um, Cause it's very different from the bombers. And were you, did it take some time to grow on you? Were you in right away? Yeah, it did. Um, to be honest with you, and this may sound bad. My first thought is that sounds like a girl's little league softball name. I mean, literally, I think I might've verbatim said that I'm like, what is this? That's a little league girl softball team. Right. It took a couple of seasons for it to really grow on me. In fact, I don't even think I – I didn't even go to a game the first season. And it wasn't because I was not wanting to go. It's just it didn't work out. But uh, 2017, 2018, I started going to a few games. And uh, by 2019, I was I was like, okay, I'm I'm digging in on this team. And I kind of got – I kind of got my love of minor league baseball back. I mean, you know, like I said, my heart was broken in, in 04 when the Bombers left and I couldn't stay with them and – I just kind of got out. I fell out of love with minor league baseball. 
Right. And if I didn't have a, a hometown team, I could have, I mean, there's plenty of teams around me. I could have gone to, to support. It just, it just didn't become a thing. Cause I didn't have a team here to go, go watch. Um, you know, we did have the blowfish summer league baseball team. So I, I did catch some of that and tried to follow them, but they had, you know, basically a two month window and that was it. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's the, that's the curse of summer league stuff. And now the blowfish are back. I mean, yeah. they're, the blowfish are doing great as well. Uh, the, 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 the interesting thing of the blowfish is their connection to the bombers because, uh, Bill Shanahan was brought in as the general manager of the bombers when they, when they changed the name, he was part of that whole ownership oh. group. Uh, he was the general manager here from, uh, from that time in, in 92 until, um, late nineties. And then, that ownership also owned the uh, Mobile Bay Bears, and so okay. he, moved, he moved to Mobile to to run that team. And then in uh, I, I think around 2006, after the uh, the uh, Bombers left, he came back to Columbia and started the Blowfish, and he's been running the Blowfish ever since. So he he kind of fell in love with the city when he was here as a general manager, and came back and started the summer league team, and continues to run that team today. And that was not, it's not, well, first of all, not hard to fall in love with that city. Um, basically, I guess as we wrap it up, then what are some of your trips? I know you're going to be meeting up with Let's Get To out for our fifth birthday party in Omaha. But what are some other trips you guys are going to be taking this summer? So uh, actually Friday night, I'm going to be doing my first banana ball game. Okay. Okay. Well, you got to let us know how that is. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm anxiously looking forward to that. And, and I, very much so because they are also tied to several other trips that I have. Uh, we're all uh, going to see uh, the bananas in Birmingham at the end of June for a Friday and Saturday night game. Um, I've extended an invitation to Johnny Bolin and his wife to join us at Rickwood field for the Saturday game. Um, I'm pretty much set. Now I'm going to hit the uh, trash pandas that Thursday night. So I think we're going to go down there Thursday, catch the trash panda game, two bananas games in Birmingham. Oh, nice. Um, and then, and then the trip, uh, in May before that to come uh, out for the, uh, the birthday party, we actually, um, we're actually flying to Tulsa, uh, to start that trip. Okay. So going to go see the drillers and visit Colin Wilson, who I, I traveled a couple of games to last year around this area. He's now working there. Okay. So we're going to catch Tulsa. You know that's where the that's where Let's Get Two was born, the Tulsa Drillers. Oh yeah, yeah, at a game, right. yeah, at a game there. So we're we're gonna hit Tulsa, then we're coming up Friday night to see uh, the Bananas against the Monarchs in Kansas City. We'll be in Omaha on Saturday, uh, and then we're gonna come back on Sunday and catch the Kansas City Royals Atlanta, uh, excuse me, Atlanta, Oakland A's game, uh, and and fly home on Monday. So we're we're kind of hitting Major League, uh, Banana Ball, Minor League, all of it. All of it. And, I'm, and you know, I'm catching the Royals parent club and triple A team to go with the Royals single A team here. So at some point I've just got to hit the other two affiliates and I don't know if I'll get them this year, but definitely next year. Yeah. And we're, and it's funny cause we're, we'll be doing this, the trash pandas Easter week. Well, that'll be our first uh, road trip of the summer. All right, Donnie, we will see you man in just a few months. Thanks so much for jumping on. Let's get to. Hey, thanks a lot for having me. I was glad to talk Columbia baseball. Camera, play ball, the best in baseball cinema. And welcome to Lights, Camera, Play Ball. And this just in, Major League, the movie, it's awesome. It's as awesome as this Major League shirt. Major League is now my number one baseball movie. And for many, this is a no-brainer of a decision. It's as important to baseball as, say, It's a Wonderful Life is important to Christmas. For others, that statement is an affront to some weird Costner cult. So I rewatched it the other day like I do every year, and I found myself laughing like I hadn't in a while. And it dawned on me a couple of things. First, 100% of the jokes, they're about baseball. Baseball is rarely not present from the plot, and it's funny, and it's easily one of the greatest movie-going experiences I've ever had. By the time Wild Thing played, the theater went nuts completely bonkers. 
Another weird thing did occur to me that Charlie Sheen's not the star of the movie, which is why the whole Wild Thing thing, Wild Thing thing, is second to last and Tom Berenger, fellow veteran of the movie Platoon and the bigger star at the time, gets the whole big moment with the fake home run swinging bunt single thing, also known as Emily Nyman's Greatest Nightmare. While the sequels clearly pale in comparison, particularly the second one, I'm not sure Major League could be any more perfect. And I know people are going, hey, Jim, your show was actually named after a scene in the movie Bull Durham. I clearly love Bull Durham, and the baseball stuff in that movie is the best of any movie ever. But I do feel the movie is weighed down by the whole romantic sex comedy aspect. It's pretty uninteresting. And I'm a huge rom-com guy. 12 of the 15 movies I produced could be classified as a romantic comedy. But the Sarandon Costner story, it just doesn't do it for me. And if a sex scene with people in socks going at it in a puddle of milk is your bag, I don't know what to tell you. Now, Field of Dreams is my second favorite, and I adore the movie. But in a way, that movie kind of transcends baseball. So if I'm using the strict criteria, a movie about baseball, time spent playing the game, and it's a high-quality movie, then the award has to go to Major League. And while we're at it, because you asked, my top 10 baseball movies are Major League, Field of Dreams, Bull Durham, Moneyball, Fever Pitch, For Love of the Game, Ken Burns Baseball, Trouble with the Curve, 42, and The Battered Bastards of Baseball. Now, there are those who want to cancel Major League because the team is still the Indians in the movie. The academic in me says, listen, it's really hard to judge a film by our times today. They should be judged by the context of the times in which they were made. Put it more bluntly, get a life. If you don't like it, don't watch it. Certainly don't get all high and mighty on your friends for still enjoying the movie. It's a very simple equation. There are lots of reasons and things to be up in arms about. I wouldn't go see a new Kevin Spacey movie, but I'm still going to enjoy The Usual Suspects. In this world, there are a lot of hills that are worth dying on. I don't think this one's it. So, just be cool. And thanks for coming to my TED Talk. to close it out, the right-hander from Houston, Texas, James Christopher. So that does wrap up episode two of Let's Get To, and this is one of my favorite episodes every year because it reminds me of one of my favorite jokes when we were on set. Anytime we shot the second shot for scene two, I would grab the slate and say, it's take to be, you know, or not to be, that's the question. Right, come for your dad jokes and your fun baseball talk. Anyway, that does wrap up this episode of Let's Get To. Thanks to Donnie, Paul, and John for jumping on. Make sure you check out the Columbia Fireflies online to get some of that sweet, sweet gear. We are just getting started this season. We've got trips all over the place. We've got special guests, live episodes, and more. And look for us on TikTok, if only to watch an old man and indie filmmaker struggle against his instinct to shoot videos horizontally. Again, we have just about two weeks till the Major League Baseball season kicks off. Then it's going to be balls to the wall until September and October. So buckle up, get ready, get your peanuts, get your Cracker Jack, and most importantly, let's get to. Let's Get To is presented by Twitchy Dolphin Media. Creative directors, Jessica Bybee Jedgetts. Executive producers, James Christopher, Andy Tumchesson, and Scott McIntyre. Produced by Andrew Nelson and Eric Mertens. Associate producers Timothy Jedgetts and Jess Canaster. All content created by Let's Get To is the sole property of Twitchy Dolphin Media. All content created by teams covered in the episode are the sole property of the trademark holders. 